As is the stroke length, I have the piston, it moves at the distance of S feet. Okay, that is the stroke length. How much do I move? DC squared. So initial equation is this form. Pi D squared over 4. Okay, but I add 144 just to convert from feet to inch. So cross section area. Cross section area is a circle shape, right? Multiplied by length. Okay, that equal to sweep volume. Okay, on piston displacement volume. Good. So this is for the case of head end displacement. I have the piston uh, over there. If I compress this direction, gas in front of it get compressed, right? And the volume is that volume. But if I pull it back and I do another compression, it will be this area on the back. So this area on the back is d squared, dc squared minus dr squared. So I have to have the overall area minus the rod area. Okay, so this will be sweep area. So for single acting cylinder on the crank end displacement, I use this equation. So it's just crossing the area multiplied by the length that moves. So this tell me uh, piston displacement or actual volume that's swept by the piston. Then I have double acting. Double acting is I add those two equations together, then I get that. Okay, that is for double acting. Good. Next one. Uh, volumetric efficiency in practice. Okay. In theory, we talked about it already. Gas volume pump per cycle divided by stroke volume is one minus compression ratio to power of one over k minus one and clearance ratio. In practice, we use percent and we didn't start from 100. We start from 96, okay? To account for any imperfection in the compression, okay? Any lubricant, any gap, or any some imperfection. And we add ratio of compressibility factor over there, okay? So use the practice one, okay? The theory one, then we add some more um, coefficient to make it more realistic. Percent E sub V is the uh, stage volumetric efficiency. R compression ratio, C cylinder clearance, percentage of piston displacement, okay. Z S compressibility factor, accession compressibility factor at this chart, K ratio of specific heat. Uh, totally? Everyone sign? Yes. Can I have it? Can I have a sign up chief? Uh Next next to you what is it? Landon? Yeah. Okay, you will help me with the question, right? Landon. How much is the ratio of the specific heat? It should be between what value and what value? Can it be less than one? I don't think so. Okay. Very good. This question is not in the exam, okay? It's, we don't ask anything about the conversion in this exam yet for the theory part, but you should know that it's about 1.35, 1.6, 1.4, 1.4, 1.4 or less or something. Not less than one. Okay. Cylinder throughput capacity, okay? How much is the uh, gas throughput at a standard condition in the cubic foot per uh, Minute. Okay, that is M. So I have <coughs> QA. Uh, gas QA is the gas at the actual cubic foot per minute. Equal to E sub V, volumetric efficiency multiplied by piston displacement. Okay, then I get QA. QA is the actual volume. Look at E sub V definition again. Gas pumped over stroke volume, right? And we multiply by stroke volume, we get actual gas that we pump. Actual gas that we pump is the actual volume, but it's not standard volume. I add something over there to do the conversion from actual volume to standard volume, okay? 
and then I get a new equation. The relationship between actual volume and standard volume. Standard volume. Okay. Rock load. How much is rock load? Now we can tell how much is how many million cubic foot per day that pump uh, that go through the compressor. Now let's talk about rock load. Here's the equation for rock load. Single acting cylinder, double acting cylinder. So we have RL sub C, RL sub T, AP, PD. AP is cross section area of the piston. Okay. PD is discharge pressure. Okay. This is single acting. So in single acting, we compress against, so this side is pressurized gas, but this side is nothing, right? So the rod loss has to have pressure multiplied by this is pressure multiplied by area, right? Subscript C is for the compression. Look at tension, rod load in tension. When we pull it back, we don't have to have any any rod load in anything. Okay? But for double acting, we have pressure on both sides, right? We have pressure on both sides. And it has to act against the difference in the pressure. So uh, rod load for the compression is corrosion area multiplied by delta P plus uh, AR, PS, AR is the cross area of the rod itself. And P is a suction or something. So here's the equation. And we have some recommendation. Rod diameter, okay, and allowable rod load. Let's take a look at uh, calculation example and we are done. Compressor 500 PSIG, okay, at 100F, compress 800 PSIG at 100F to 1000 PSIG by using an engine driven separable compressor. Engine is rated for 1,600 horsepower at 900 RPM. Horsepower is proportional to speed. The compressor, compressor frame has 6 7-inch bore by 6.0-inch stroke, double acting cylinder, with a minimum current of 17.92%, a rod load limit of 25,000 pounds and rod diameter of 1.75 inch. Assume a uh, specific heat ratio of 1.26, uh, S of 6 inch. S is the stroke length, right? Compressibility factor at the suction is 0.88. Compressibility factor at the discharge of is 0.85, okay? Calculate discharge temperature, volumetric efficiency, required clearance, rod load, and require horsepower. Calculate the lowest suction pressure at which this unit can compress 100 million standard cubic foot day. Okay. Is it too difficult? It is going to be difficult if there is no equation given. Okay. But if it is, but if the equation is given, we just do the equation. Look at this charge temperature, or this part can be on the exam because it's before today, right? This temperature is suction temperature multiplied by compression ratio raised to the power of k minus 1 over k multiplied by 1 over eta. Eta is 1.0 for reciprocating and 0.8 for cylindrical compressor. The equation for the theory part, theory part doesn't have 1 over eta. Okay? That is for <laughs> theory. I think that is the equation that is given um, on the exam given without eta oh, but this time it's have z instead but if we want it a little bit more accurate so we have eta so if it's receipt unit just put one over one which is one put the number in the trick here is do everything in psia step one convert everything into psia okay so that's why it's 815 it's not 800 right and convert temperature into Rankine, okay? And that's compression ratio. Substitute the value in, we get this hot temperature, 126 Fahrenheit. Is it too hot? No, it's not too hot. Too hot means more than 250 Fahrenheit. We don't want it to go more than 250 Fahrenheit. Okay, this hot temperature is done. 
Second step, percent is a V or clearance percent. So use the practice one. 96 minus R minus C, R to the power of something, that's just the equation, right? The given equation. Compression ratio is a ratio per stage. This one is per stage, okay? And it's the absolute value is 1.245. Percent is a V, okay? We have substitute the value. Look at that R. So that R is the R that we have. Clearance ratio or percentage come from that one, okay? 17.92, we put it in, okay? R, we put it in, uh, K value, Z value, we put everything and we have percent is a V of 90.6%. Volumetric efficiency in practice, that's what it is. Okay. Okay. Next one we calculate. Required clearance. Okay. Required clearance. Mm -hmm. Oh let's 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 follow the calculation and, and let's talk later on what is this about. Look at this one. PD equal to 2 multiplied by dc squared minus dr squared. Where is that number 2 come from? Uh, that number 2. In the formula itself, do we have number 2? Yes. For double acting, we have that number 2, right? So that is where that number 2 come from. Okay. And this is just copy the equation. Now we substitute the value. S is stroke length, which is 6 feet. RPM, 900. DR, given, that is given. Put everything in, we get 233. And that is the uh, piston displacement volume. Okay. If we look at it, that S, is this okay? That is a stroke length, and we have what else do we do? We have six of seven inch ball by six inch stroke. So, compressor frame has seven inch ball and six inch stroke. That seven inch go to D sub C, okay. And what about this sub R? 1.75. Where does that come from? Rod diameter. So rod diameter is 1.75. So 6 inch stroke is S, right? S equal to 6 inch. Put everything in, we get uh, um, PD. Piston displacement. Only one piston. But this unit has six of that, right? I have six of seven inch ball by six inch stroke. So I have six throw, six throw. So because I have six throw, so piston displacement total is six multiplied by that equal to that much. Actual cubic foot per minute, okay? Then I calculate the actual volume throughput. Put uh, volumetric efficiency multiplied by uh, piston displacement total, get the answer that much. Based on this much, actual million static cubic foot that can flow is substitute value in is more than 100 million cubic foot per day. But in this example, we just want but 100 million cubic foot per day, right? If we do everything, just put all those information in, we get more than 100 million standard cubic foot per day. But if we want to do just 100 standard cubic foot per day, we have to make the compressor to be a little less efficient. Okay, how do we do that? How do we have the compressor work a little less? We may have more clearance, okay? 
have more clear lines instead of have a long stroke. We, we, we have more clear lines. So we have the same stroke length, but here we have more gap. It's not that efficiency. Or we have less RPM. So early on we use what? Mm. This one is 900 RPM. So it is 1,900 horsepower at 900 RPM. I can do less than 900 RPM to deliver less. Okay. So 106.9 mmSCFD is too high. Not too high, but too high. Okay, too high. Higher than 100 million. Decrease throughput by reduce the speed. Increasing clearance or reduce the cylinder volume or lowering suction pressure. By doing any of this, we can have it deliver a little less. Why do we want to match 100 million? Okay. So this is actual throughput of 100 million. We don't want to pump or don't want to compress more than what is coming in, right? If it comes more, we want to compress more. If it comes less, it comes just 100 million. But we try to compress and push it through like 106. It's too much. And we don't have to put that much work in. We can do a little less. So if we decrease RPM, so what I do is, instead of put 106.9, I put 100 and try to calculate QA. And from QA, I back calculate the total uh, piston displacement. And from my total piston displacement, I have equation on piston displacement and RPM, right? For double acting, do you remember this? Piston displacement and RPM. There's a relationship. This one is a relationship between piston displacement and RPM. So I can have a little less RPM instead of 900, I can have just about 850 RPM and I will deliver that much. This example is to show that the actual compressor, when they design it, there's a room for adjustment, okay? The speed, for example, can adjust, okay? So it can handle a little less or a little more. And it also have all this valve, you see? If it is come too much, it go to flare valve or something. Good? Instead of decrease the speed, this example also show, hey, what if I don't want to increase the speed? I want to uh, have more clearance. What do I do? This is a procedure. You review it by yourself. And what about reduce the size or something? This tell you how to do that, okay? You review it. But, and if we reduce all that, look at, look at the end, uh, okay, skip all this and continue on the rock load. Rock load is just to check if it is going to exceed the maximum uh, load, load limit or not. It just put the value in and it's not exceed. Some of them is negative value, that is the uh, rock intention, okay, not in compression. And absolute value of those things should not exceed the limit that we have early on. Okay, let me put in the equation. This is to check that it's fine. Okay. Uh, horsepower requirement. This equation is given in the example of Anna Stewart. It is a little different than the equation give, given earlier by Anna Stewart. A little different is these two terms. But if you combine them, is almost the same, okay? It's almost the same. This is how they calculate the brake horsepower. The actual horsepower required by the engine, okay? It's just substitute value in, and <clears throat> then we get the horsepower. So in, in this example, we put PD, PS, everything in, Q sub G, okay, 100. 0.7, that's E value. Uh, where does that 0.7 come from? 0.7 has to be some assumption given earlier. Oh, it doesn't tell you about Okay, put everything in, and then you can get the uh, brake horsepower. It just substitute the value, just that. 
If you use this equation, it is a little different than the equation even before. If you use the equation before, it's fine too. Because most people use just 22 multiplied by something, just that. Okay? So this equation or equation given before is already accurate. This term is the only term that is different. And when you check on it, it's not going to be much. Early on you have oh, early on you have horsepower is oh previous lecture. It doesn't have suction pressure term or something. But when you multiply it together, it close enough. Okay? It close enough. Okay, when you look at the compressor, um, oh, there's a required horsepower and lower suction pressure. There's a suction pressure calculation or something. Uh, review it by yourself. I think if you get to rot load, that's okay already. Okay, the part of this example is we can reduce the RPM a little bit so that we can match with the volume that we need to compress. We don't want to compress then what is coming in. Um, okay, by now you know all this, right? When we look at it, we have the back part, very big. This one. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Ryan Gerflas, is that you? You understand anything? What is that part in the back? What is that for? Cooling, yeah, aerial cooler. It's just to cool, okay? Next one Brandon L. Gillespie. Where's Brandon? Brandon. Where's this one? Oh, what is one? What do you call that? It's a scrubber, very right? good. So, and that is the actual compressor, right? And this is from another side. You know almost everything. So this one has this side and that side, and we have the engine. And the area cooler in the back. Okay. After we compress it, we sell it. Okay. And here's the unit conversion, BDU, G value, pressure, everything. And by now you should be able to do all this. Okay. Differentiate all this. This is something that we should just memorize this just for this Thursday. Okay. Just that. More question? No more question. Let's do um, uh, for the pump part, <coughs> let's start with some video first and then we go to the theory. How about that? So, centrifugal pump. Let's take a look at it. it it's not going to be boring, huh? I promise. Okay. It will be just, just fine. conceptual overview of working of centrifugal pumps. At the heart of the system lies the impeller. And the impeller? It has got a series of curved vanes fitted inside shroud plates. The impeller is always immersed in water. When the impeller is made to rotate, it makes the fluid surrounding it also rotate. This imparts centrifugal force to water particles, and the water moves radially out. Since rotational mechanical energy is transferred to the fluid, and... Okay, look at this part. <laughs> when it goes into the center, it's coming out. You see the cross-section area of the floor. It's small, early on, and it expands, right? You see the expansion? The expansion of flowing cross-section area? So when we have a constant mass flow rate and cross-section area of the flow expand, what happens? 
Do we flow a little slower? By battery equation, we flow a little slower. The velocity go down, but pressure go up, right? When we flow slower by battery equation, pressure go up. So this is how we can increase this the pressure, and the it's also rotate. Both pressure and kinetic energy of water will rise. But we spin and too, so when we spin, it flow fast. Water is getting displaced, so a negative pressure will be induced at I. Such low pressure helps in sucking fresh water stream into the system again, and this process continues. Okay, first of all, uh, pump may or may not suck water into the pump. Okay. Sometimes, if you start dry, it doesn't work. Okay. But this time, okay, they say it can suck something. This is the reason why priming is important for centrifugal pumps. If no water is present initially, the negative pressure developed by rotating air at eye of impeller will be negligibly small to suck fresh stream of water. Impeller is fitted inside a casing. So the water moving out will be collected inside it and will move in the same direction of rotation of impeller to the discharge nozzle. Here you can note one specialty of casing. It has got increasing area along the flow direction. Such increasing area will help in accommodating newly added water stream and will also help in reducing exit flow velocity. Reduction in flow velocity will result in increase in static pressure, which is required to overcome resistance of pumping system. Here you can see more details of veins inside impeller. They are backward curved veins with state-of-the-art eye configuration. This vein is extracted from a curl scar pump model. If pressure at suction side of impeller goes below vapor pressure of water, a dangerous phenomenon could happen. Water will start to boil, forming vapor bubbles and spoil impeller materials over time. This phenomenon is known as cavitation. More the suction head, lesser should be the pressure at suction side to lift water. This fact puts a limit to maximum suction head a pump can have. Careful pump selection is required to avoid problem of cavitation. Oh, what, what is that in? NPSHA. Net positive suction head available. NPSHR. Net positive suction head required. So, net positive suction head available has to be more. When we connect the pipe over here on the inlet, it should not be a lot of pressure drop or anything. Okay, the pump, the pipe size there should be big enough. If we try to pump faster than what is coming in, we create cavitation. Okay, they don't want air bubble inside. And we will talk more about that. Pipe is enclosed. Semi-open and open impellers are also in use depending upon application. If the working fluid is cloggy in nature, it is preferred to use open kind of impeller. More cloggy fluid, we use this. Okay. But they are slightly less efficient. Less efficient. Mechanical design of centrifugal pump is always challenging. A shaft is used to connect between the impeller and motor. Since water pressure inside casing is huge, a proper sealing arrangement is imperative in arresting water leakage through shaft casing clearance. Mechanical seal or stuffing box based mechanism is used for this purpose. Impeller is mounted on bearings. But at suction side of impeller, it is not advisable to fit a bearing, since it will block the flow. So bearings have to be fitted at the other end. This means impeller is mounted like a cantilever. For high flow rate pumps, a bearing housing with cooling oil is necessary for improving life of bearings.
We thank Curtis Star Brothers for their technical support and creation of this video. Okay, we, we thank them for that video and we go to the next one. Uh, I think I want you to say the self priming consists of our very own 11.5A3 E1.5 single phase unit driven by a variable frequency drive. It is the exact same 11.5A3 that we build on a regular basis here at Gorman Rub with one small exception. We have taken this particular pump, the 11.5A3, and we have sectioned the volute casing at the same location where the wear plate is installed. We have mounted a... Okay, look at this one. Where do you think is the direction of the the blade? Is it going to spin uh, spin counterclockwise or clockwise? Okay, let's let's take a look. Let's take a look. We normally place inside the pump for priming. We need some water for priming. Familiar with self priming centrifugal pumps. We know that we must first fill the balloon with water. We can now start the pump. and watch what actually occurs inside of the pump during priming. After we fill the balloon casing with water and we energize the pump, the impeller turns in a counterclockwise rotation. Counterclockwise. The initial prime of the pump is slung through the balloon scroll or the ever-increasing water channel into a pressure cavity or a discharge chamber inside the balloon. Inside this discharge chamber, the air and water separate. The heavy water falls back down through a recirculation port, and the air then is evacuated through an open-ended line or through an air release device. All the while that we recirculate the water inside the casing and remove the air from the top, we create a low pressure at the eye of this impeller. Due to differential in pressure, atmospheric pressure that we live around every day, is higher than the lower pressure created at the eye of this impeller. Due to that differential in pressure, atmospheric pressure outside begins to force liquid up the suction pipe. As liquid moves up the suction pipe, it pushes all the air ahead of it into the balloon casing where it is handled through the recirculation process. Again, the air is handled off the top and the heavy water recirculates back down into the balloon scroll area. I'll close this valve right now and create a suction line capable of pulling a vacuum. Ahead of it moves the air, pushes it into, handles it through the recirculation process, and once the water arrives, the pump then goes to complete operation. You see that? For cell priming, initially we have to have some water in it first. We cannot just pump dry. So when we have a little water inside, we pump it, air go out, it's like a separator with the pump. So water coming down, we spin a little bit more, it can suck water in. Okay. That's a self-pumping pump. So next time is this Thursday. Okay, this Thursday we still have lecture. We will come to the lecture and in the evening we have ten. Okay? We will watch a little more video. So Thursday, uh, lecture plus test. Goodbye.